I want to take a second and introduce Julie Hudson to everybody. Julie, can you stand up for a second? <laughs> Julie is going to be filling in for me while I'm gone. This is my last Sunday before sabbatical. And you'll be here all the three weeks, right? All the three, yes. And then Kathy will be filling in during those three. So you guys are going to be in awesome hands. And we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye. 11 weeks. So, yeah, you'll have three weeks of Kathy and eight weeks of Julie. <laughs> and so, I hope you guys will all make them welcome. And, um, like I said, I have no worries. what is a sabbatical? A sabbatical is basically a time of rest and renewal for both me as well as the congregation. So you guys will spend some time. Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about that? The prayer? We'll talk about that at the congregational meeting. Okay? Okay. I, I hope everybody will join us after worship in the basement. We have some refreshments and we'll have a little congregational meeting and talk about what does sabbatical mean for us as well as for Sally. So, yeah, but it, it's, a, it's a time of refocusing, rest, renewal. I personally will be talking, I talked a little bit about my sermon today. I'll be talking, looking into community and what community is, and what is the beloved community and what Christ wants us to be. And you guys are going to be spending some time talking about community, talking about prayer. So, um, it's just a time to regather, refocus. Does that answer your question? Now the words are getting away from you. Huh? Now the words are getting away from you. Yes, <laughs> yes you're going to get away from me. I want to be mean about it. <laughs> no, it's always better, too, when everybody has some time apart, so that'll be good. Okay, I don't want you to think I'm being mean. No, I'm not. I know you're not being mean, so I know. I know you're not being mean. I know you love me, so I know. Yeah. <laughs> um... As Sarah said, we're having a congregational meeting after worship today, so I hope you'll join us downstairs. Um, October 3rd, next Sunday, Peace Lutheran is going to be here to have a Peace Serves Day. So John Riley is going to be heading it up. Uh, and what is it? They're coming to do, they're going to paint our doors for one, and hopefully do a couple other projects around here. And so we'll need some people to join them and to be present with them. It's nothing like worse than having a, a church show up to help us and nobody from the congregation here. So I hope you'll plan on staying um, after worship and asking John uh, what, what, what next, you know, next Sunday. You said I can help. Yeah, you can help. You, we need you to help. Um, and then Bible studies. They remind everybody again that there's Bible study on Tuesday evening. We get Zoom. We're just finishing up Second Kings, and this week, and then this week they're also deciding what's going to be next. And Kathy will be leading that while I'm gone. Um, it's, it's actually a really good study, and a lot of fun. Um, I don't know. Maybe at twelve thirty. Twelve fifteen. Twelve thirty. Um, and then Deb still got her Bible study on two days at noon. Yes. Yes. So, uh, I hope you'll maybe engage in one of those. She has lunch and then Bible study. So, is there any other announcements today before we get started? Wednesday's my birthday. Wednesday's your birthday? Maybe we can sing happy birthday to you as at the end of worship today. So, uh, good. And Gwen just had a birthday. So, she had a birthday on Friday. So, lots of birthdays this Anybody else have birthday this month? She's outside. She says she's out in the field. All right, then Rudy, will you play us into worship and we can ready our hearts for worship.
So every time that you get a chance to do something and, and um, attempt to something that is going to show you about another culture, another way of thinking, I think it's a good thing. Uh, so we're having a um, concert on October 16 at the Green Lawn Cemetery in uh, 1000 Green Lawn Avenue. It's free, it's at the, at the cemetery. It's not outside, I think it's at the, they have a little building. And we will be playing that music. Okay, so this is uh, one of the things we're going to be playing. This is a uh, Wabango, it's a dance. It's uh, usually you can hear it in the east coast of Mexico. It's beautiful, uh, women and men. Uh, where something very beautiful and um, it's very happy music, so I hope you like it. hope and 
love. And all God's people said, Amen. Hear the voice of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim release to the captives. In the name of Jesus Christ, I proclaim to you that your sins are forgiven and you are released. The joy of the Lord is your strength and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are yours forever. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand for the reading of the 
Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw you casting out demons, someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where there are worms never die and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but it is. If salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Whoever is not against us is for us. Don't put a stumbling block before one of these little ones. If your hand, your foot, or your eye causes you to stumble, get rid of it. Cut it off. Pluck it out. Be at peace with one another. Jesus' message in our gospel today is couched in some hard words and perhaps a bit of exaggeration. But the underlying message is clear. Your actions matter. So get your act together. Jesus speaks these words today to the disciples who have been struggling to understand Jesus' teaching and warnings about what is to come. But it's not just a simple miscommunication. Instead of listening to Jesus, the disciples don't understand because they're worrying about who is the greatest, worrying about themselves, being very inward focused. Jesus' words today are meant to be a wake-up call. Words to get the disciples' attention and urge them to see the dangers of this inward focus. Jesus needs them to stop seeing things so individualistically and try to understand the big picture and what is at stake. Jesus wants them to understand the importance of their behavior, to realize that their actions have consequences. He wants them to be a bit more humble, a bit more responsible, and to try, just try, to get along with others. Jesus knows that he doesn't have much longer to be with them, and his advice for the disciples today will come in handy when he is gone. Jesus knows that the disciples don't yet know that when Jesus is gone, they will need each other. They will need to build a community of believers who will together build the church. There is no room for ego or self-centeredness. So fast forward 2,000 years, and the church today, like Jesus' disciples, still tend to argue about who is the greatest. We still tend to focus inwardly, and we don't always know how to play nice with one another. As with most things in our country, Christian faith and a person's walk with Jesus still tends to be pretty individualistic. For example, there's a good number of Christians in our nation today that think that Jesus is their personal savior instead of thinking of Jesus as one who came to save the world. We think of our membership not so much as part of the body of Christ, but to a specific church body. 
We also tend to deal with our faith in much the same way that we deal with the rest of our lives. For instance, instead of talking about being called to a certain community, most Christians today will church shop, trying out churches they like, like they would a car. Instead of the church being a place where we come together and share our gifts, often churchgoers have the expectation of what church should be doing for them, how church should make them feel. Christians in our nation today tend to think of church as something that should meet our needs. We have become consumers of church instead of disciples of Jesus Christ, people called to humbly give, and humbly serve. And instead of church helping us integrate God into every aspect of our life, we feel really good if we just make it to church on a Sunday morning. For most people, Christian community is a Sunday morning thing. So is it any wonder that 80% of the population in our country doesn't see, seem to see the need to go to church on any given Sunday? Just this week, I was on a call with the Synod about new ways to think of church. Experiential church is, I think, what they were calling it. New communities that meet in coffee shops or breweries or places where people gather around a hobby, like an art class or pottery. And while it's great that the Synod and the larger church are thinking outside the box, and it's amazing that people who would probably never step foot in a church are now at least hearing the gospel and hopefully learning about Jesus Christ? Well, that's all good and new and exciting. I can't help but wonder if these new church trends, these new consumer attitudes, aren't somehow morphing the body of Christ into something that it was never meant to be. Authentic Christian community is something that is so important to our faith journey but something I'm not sure really exists anymore. I'm going to read while I'm on this, and hopefully while I'm on sabbatical. So my hope for all you is that you too will spend some time thinking about the question, what is the body of Christ to look like? And what does authentic Christian community look like? And why is it important, not to each one of us individually, but why is it also good for the world? It's important for us to remember that Jesus didn't die so each of us individually can go to heaven. Sure, our Christian hope and promise is that eternal life is part of the package, but Jesus didn't die solely for that reason. He didn't die solely for you or solely for me, despite the messages that are coming out of the church today. Although God loves each of us very much and knows very well and knows us so well that he knows the number of hairs that we have on our head, the truth is Jesus died for the world. Jesus died so that the world could be reconciled back to God. Jesus dying for me and Jesus dying for the world are two totally separate things and take us down totally different paths. If my walk with God is all about my own salvation, then what do I need all y'all for? I could stay at home and work that out with God all by myself, couldn't I? If it's not about me, or if it is all about me, excuse me, then of course church should also be all about me. But if my job as a Christian is to join God in reconciling the world back to God, which is what we hear in 2 Corinthians 5, if God has given each of us as the body of Christ the ministry of reconciliation, if we are to be God's ambassadors, then I not only need you, I have a responsibility to you. We have a responsibility to each other. And I think it's that responsibility to one another that we have forgotten about. That's what's missing in our church today. We know we're to love each other, but we think that love means simply being nice to each other when we gather. But if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, love goes a bit beyond that. Beyond being patient and kind, we are told that love bears all things 
believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Christian community should be the one place that we can count on. But that doesn't really fit with our consumer model of Christianity that we find in our world today, does it? The ironic thing is, is that everything in Scripture just sort of assumes the communal aspect of faith. So I'm not quite sure where the church has gotten to where it is today. Scripture uses the image of the body of Christ to talk about Christian community. Many parts working together. As one commentator put it, you can get along without eyes if you make an adjustment. You can rely on all your other senses, and you might miss out on some of the design or visual delights that the world offers. But you can go without eye, you can be eyeless and still cope. But a bodiless eye is unimaginable. The most beautiful eyes in the world when detached from the body are lifeless and they can't do what they were created to do. The body is what gives the individual parts life. Amen. Although scripture has a lot to say about community, there's an obscure passage in Exodus 17 that I think really kind of simply explains the importance of community and why we can't go it alone. The story begins with the Israelites in the wilderness. And while the Israelites are in the wilderness, they're attacked by a powerful enemy. So Moses turns to Joshua and tells him to take some men and go fight. He promises Joshua that if he stands on top of the hill, he will hold his staff up in his hand. So when Moses holds the staff up, Israel prevails in battle. And whenever he lowers the staff, Israel's enemies prevail. But how long can one person hold a staff in the air? If it was me, probably about five seconds before my shoulders would start cramping. Moses probably did a little better than me, but eventually even Moses' arms got tired. If Moses had been alone, the Israelites would have lost the battle. But Moses wasn't alone. And his brother Aaron went and got him a rock to sit on. And then Aaron and another man called Hur actually held Moses' arms in the air, one standing on each side, so that the staff remained in the air until the Israelites were victorious. This world is a hard place, and we too have powerful, a powerful enemy that we fight against on a daily basis. All of us will grow weary. All of us need each other to help us hold our hands up when we can't. Whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, being a Christian involves community. Eugene Peterson said it bluntly, if God is my father, then y'all are my family. So the question is not whether we are going to be a part of community, but the question instead is how are we going to live into and grow into being a part of that community? And that is where our gospel today can be of some help. Remember Jesus' advice? If someone isn't against us, they're for us. As Christians, we need to stop looking at all the differences that separate us. Yeah. We need to stop looking at our differences and truly be the body of Christ. Because, of course, the body sees things differently. A hand is going to see things very differently than a foot. In fact, the foot needs to see things differently than the hand. We need to embrace our differences, not point fingers at each other and say, God, do you see what they're doing over there? God, do you see how they're worshiping? We need to stop digging our heels in and demanding that everyone be just like us. I think we do a pretty good job embracing diversity here, but we could do better. I challenge everyone in the next three months to pick one person that you do not know very well. 
and make an effort to get to know them better. Stop running off right after church and take some time to share together after worship. Amen. Invite somebody out to lunch. Hebrews 10 tells us that we are to consider how to stir one another up in love and good works. As a community, we need to know each other. So not only do we know how to be there for one another, but we also know how to encourage one another to grow in their faith. Not to do things for somebody else, but to simply walk alongside another person, encouraging them through life. What was some of the other advice we, Jesus gave us? Don't be a stumbling block to little ones. Whether those little ones, if somebody who's new to the faith, or those little ones are literally little ones, we all need to take seriously how we mentor people in the faith. I know Deb brings her little great-grandchildren here to church because they're not going to hear about God at home. How many of us realize that when those babies think back about their experience in church in a few years, we are what they will remember. We will divine church for them. Amen. Did we ignore them? Or did we love them? Did we set a good example for them of God's love and what it looks like? Something as simple as being present to a child at church can make all the difference in their lives when they come to think about church as an adult. It isn't rocket science. Children who have good experiences at church grow up to be adults who go to church. Children who get fussed at and ignored at church don't. Let's embrace the little ones in our midst. It's a lot being better than being thrown into a mill pond with a stone around our neck, as Jesus says. And what about Jesus' warning against sin? What part of you needs to be cut off? What part of ourselves do we need to work on to make sure that we are walking with God to the best of our ability? What is keeping us from fully committing to being in community with God and with one another? These things matter. Now it may seem a little harsh for Jesus to say simply get rid of it, just cut it off. And in our individual mindset, we think we're forgiven. God will forgive me. Why do I need to get rid of it? But what about how sin affects community? How does it affect the community when we don't fully engage because of our sin? What if we take instead of give? Do we realize how many people have been hurt by the church? That's one of the biggest reasons so many people in our world today stopped going to church. It is hard to be in community. People hurt one another, sometimes without even knowing it. But community, if we struggle and love together, has the ability to make each of us more aware of the parts of ourselves that need cutting off, as well as lifted up. Christian community should help each of us be our best self. And finally, Jesus says, be at peace with one another. I want to end today with a verse from Philippians 4. Whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Keep doing the things that you have learned and received and hear and seen in Christ, and the God of peace will be with you. So many in our world today are looking for peace. And Paul tells us exactly how to find it. Please know I will be praying for each of you over the next few months. I hope you will also pray for me and for this community of faith. My hope is that each of you in my absence will dive into this community. I hope you will take it upon yourself to find out what is needed and take ownership and responsibility of this community. Because this is your community. God has called you to this place and it can only be what God desires and needs it to be if everyone joins in. 
May the next 11 weeks be a time of growth and blessing for each of you as you find your way together. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. O oh Lord, we come before you and we just thank you for one another. We need you, Lord, but we also need each other for this community to survive, for our faith walk to survive. We need each other, dear Lord. I pray this morning, especially for Mr. Fred, for Sonia, for Gwen and Ross, for Marilyn after hip surgery, for Peggy, for Retta's daughter, for Beth Riley and the family I saw upon her marriage yesterday. Dear Lord, I pray for this congregation in this time of upcoming sabbatical. Be with me as well as this community, dear Lord. Let this be fruitful time. Let this be time where you reveal yourself to us in a mighty way. Dear Lord, I pray for all those who continue to struggle with COVID. Dear Lord, I pray for those in this nation who refuse to get the vaccine, dear Lord. Open their eyes, dear Lord. Help them see that they're only hurting themselves. I pray for our health care workers. Dear Lord, let, let them know how important they are, how needed they are and help us value and appreciate them. I pray for our teachers, dear Lord, too, as they try to teach in this crazy time. Be with our leaders of this nation and of the world. Dear Lord, be with the people of Afghanistan as terror continues to strike that country. I now offer, offer or invite anybody who would like to offer their own prayers to offer their own prayers now, either silently or loud as the Spirit leads.
Lord. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Draw me close to you.
And if you feel so led, pray a blessing over Pastor Sally. This time is focused on praying for Sally and her time. We'll focus in the next 11 weeks on praying for ourselves and our community. <laughs> this is about Pastor Sally. So let's bow our heads, lift your hand as you would if you were uh, laying hands on Pastor Sally, if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, and I'd like to open it up for anybody to pray, and then I'll close with a prayer of blessing. Heavenly Mother, Father, Sister, and Brother, I'm very, very grateful to be in a place where I can, where, a place of understanding, a place of acceptance, and a place where I can learn and grow. I ask a special blessing on our leader. I'm going to miss our long conversations about absolutely nothing or something very, very significant. <laughs> I ask a very special blessing on Pastor Sally and Mike during this time of rejuvenation and meditation and learning and growth and ask that you bring both of them back with a revived spirit. Yes. 
ready to continue to lead us and to continue to endure my questions <laughs> and our wonderful conversations that I'm very, very grateful for. Yes, I ask in your name. Lord, your mercy. Yeah, I pray. May this work and these weeks ahead challenge you towards newness. Yes. Call you toward the Spirit and renew you as in the waters of baptism. May God kindle in your mind creativity and vision to continue journeying beyond all that is weary to joy and peace and restoration. May you be refined and refreshed. May you be gentle with yourself. Yes. May you lean on Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the nourishing of your soul. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you. And may the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you. And may the Lord give you peace.